the US-Mexico border. Every year, thousands of migrants try to cross illegally into the United States in search of a better life. But as US authorities tighten up border security, more and more migrants are risking their lives by crossing through remote desert regions. Many don't make it. In the past 10 years, over 2,000 unidentified bodies have ended up at this morgue in Arizona alone. I think of it as the smell of death. Um, it's a smell of, of bad death. I'm Will Grant, and in this Our World, I meet a remarkable woman who's dedicated years of her life trying to identify the bodies of dead migrants and return them to their families. And we meet migrants, preparing to make the illegal border crossing despite the dangers of the long trek in searing temperatures. Tucson, Arizona. A desert city just north of the border with Mexico, it has a unique and growing problem. The Pima County morgue has seen a huge increase in the number of bodies it's received over the past decade. So much so that Tucson now has the third highest number of unidentified human remains in the United States after New York and Los Angeles. Many are now just skeletal remains. Almost all were migrants who've succumbed to heat, exhaustion or dehydration in the desert. So here we have the right uh, shoulder blade. Here's a piece of the right clavicle. This is a probable uh, male that uh, was found in the desert in 2013, so it's from last year. So the color of the bone is white. Um, that's because it's been on the surface of the desert and exposed to the sun. Also, the drying out from being exposed to the sun um, causes the bone to fracture. So if you look at this bone here, which is the left femur, you can see this, uh, this fracture, running this fracture right there. Dr. Hess and his pathologists tag the bodies John or Jane Doe until their identity is discovered. Since 2001, we've had about uh, uh, 2,300 um, remains of people that we believe to be uh, migrants. We've identified about 65% of those, so we still have about 800 uh, to 850 that are unidentified. If you contrast that to other sort of mass fatality events, like a plane crash, usually the, the identification rate of those goes up a lot. But there you have a manifest, or who's supposed to be on the aircraft, and it's a matter of determining who's who. Here, we don't have that. Instead, the burden of identification has fallen on Robin Reinecke and her small team along the corridor. Robin arrived at the medical examiner's office as an anthropology student in 2006. I really came here um, to learn, and I basically didn't realize that I was walking into a mass disaster setting and saying, hey, can I study what you're doing and so I was basically handed a stack of work um, which from there has been an incredible honor to take on as, as my own job. Robin inherited a fledgling program which is now expanded into a non-profit human rights organization. They painstakingly match missing persons data with the forensic records of bodies found in the desert. It's also become a very personal mission for Robin. I lost my father very suddenly and unexpectedly, and that changed everything. I could recognize that the families were facing something that most people wouldn't understand, and um, I, from that point, kind of began pouring myself into the work. Just witnessing it all, it's really... Um, and that work is piling up. Each of these files represents a body that the team is still trying to identify. So this is a 2006 case still unidentified, found June 20th. We actually rely very heavily on the forensic anthropology report. So there is some information in here that 
one day if somebody comes forward looking for a family member that might suddenly trigger a memory that there's information in here that could be linked to that. Exactly. But some of the most poignant clues to identification are the possessions found with the bodies. What have we got? There's three cards of Saint Saint, Saint Ramon, Saint Benedictus and Saint Peter. A yeah. rosary here. A wooden rosary, is that? Looks yes. like it, yeah. Some US dollars that of course they were hoping to be able to use in this country. It's, it's sort of quite a pathetic little sight really in its own way. It's very, yeah. it's very simple, humble. humble kind of handful of possessions. I really spend a long time looking at the items. They're powerful to me because I know how important they can be for the investigation and even how important they can be to the family. Mm. We think of them as sacred items. But on the other hand, you know, you or I wouldn't want to be defined by the things we happen to be carrying in our pocket the day that we, you know, pass away. Most of the bodies are found here, the Sonoran Desert. The hottest desert in North America, its summer temperatures can reach 50 degrees Celsius. It's a vast area that stretches from the southwest of the United States to the Mexican coast. For migrants crossing illegally into the US, they need to trek for several days. If they get lost or injured or run out of supplies, the result is often fatal. Once you're outside in this wilderness, you begin to get a sense of the sheer number of factors you'd have to contend with trying to cross it. It's the heat out here. The tarantulas and rattlesnakes, we've been told, are all around us. And of course, you'd need enough food and water to get through. It doesn't surprise me that a vast number of people run into trouble somewhere along the line. Dotted along the Mexican side of the border are small groups of migrants, including women and young children, huddled in makeshift shelters. They've often paid thousands of dollars to criminal gangs to reach this point, but the hardest part lies ahead. Here, they must wait for their guides to lead them across the desert. But this is where so many of the migrants' dreams end. Normally in the summer, unfortunately, when so many people are dying in the desert, this would be completely full. And unfortunately, oftentimes, we have to use an external overflow cooler to save the remains. And this place has quite a, a smell to it. These people are being preserved and kept so that somewhere along the line, the families might be able to receive these remains and give them a dignified burial. Or something. Exactly. The, uh, yeah, the smell is, um, is still hard for me. Um, I, definitely, I think of it as the smell of death, of bad death. Illegal immigration is an immensely sensitive political issue in the United States. An estimated 12 million people currently live in the US without the proper papers, around 8 million of those from Mexico alone. Since the mid-1990s, consecutive US governments have poured billions of dollars into border security, a move popular with many voters. The fence erected by the United States has been extended and strengthened. But critics say this is one of the main reasons so many migrants are now dying. The border in urban areas has become almost impenetrable. And this, they say, has pushed migrants to cross the fence in less secure desert regions. The US-Mexico border was not a dangerous place for migrants until US border policies shifted. For this office, there were an average of 12 bodies found per year believed to be migrants before the year 2000. From 2001, that average goes up to 165. So what changed there was a massive influx of border patrol and military infrastructure. The US Border Patrol has one of the biggest budgets of any federal agency. They have over 20,000 agents patrolling the Mexican border and are equipped with the latest surveillance technology. But their mission is simple. Our role is 
somewhat one-dimensional in that the only thing that we do is stop people from coming through between the ports of entry. It doesn't matter if you have a visa or you do not have a visa, you have to present yourself for inspection. The agency rejects suggestions that the militarization of the border has caused the migrants' deaths. They argue that the blame lies with Mexican organized crime. Unfortunately for the people that are crossing illegally, they're in the hands of criminal organizations that have no regard for human life. And they will do anything they can to, um, to essentially extort these people and to uh, get as much money as they can off these people. Women that are out in this environment are facing being raped. Uh, everyone who's out here is looking at, at death right in the eye, whether it's at the hands of someone who might rob them or, or do worse against them, or just being out in this hostile environment. We're in the Sonoran Desert where there's very little water. It's tough to survive out here, even if you are well equipped, which most of these people are not. And it's at night that most people attempt to cross. It's not just migrants they are after, though. Stopping the illegal drugs trade is also a big part of their work. We understand that there is somebody in this area who is believed to have been trying to take marijuana across the border. Now he's just trying to uh, find a way to go south. The border patroller trying to chase down one of the two-member, two-man team. Within the space of barely two hours, they managed to pick up a group of suspected drug traffickers with the marijuana, um, and separately, a group of would-be migrants who'd hopped over the fence, and they picked them up almost as soon as they hit United States soil. So. So far, it's been a successful evening for them. It's the Border Patrol who also find most of the migrants' bodies. With the high number of deaths in the desert, there are thousands of families in Mexico and Central America who have been affected. I travelled south to Mexico to meet one of them. just driving into an area of the state of Sonora called uh, Villa Bonita, beautiful village, although in many ways it's anything but. Here we're going to meet the mother of a 19-year-old immigrant who lost his life in the desert in Arizona. Carolina Chan is a full-time mother with a passion for songwriting and music. Oh, wow. She runs a happy, chaotic home full of children and grandchildren. But one person is missing from this scene, her son, Marco Antonio. He had many dreams, many dreams. He wanted to see the world, he wanted to eat the world. And I told him that que todo era a su tiempo con calma, él no, él se quería comer el mundo, quería conocer de todo, de todo así. Y en estas tres, cuatro... One day in July 2012, Marco Antonio disappeared without saying goodbye. Carolina desperately began to search for him. Then she heard that one of his friends who'd left with him was back in town. She went to talk to him. Que oye, ¿y mi hijo dónde está? Y me dijo, no, señora, pues, es que Marco Antonio se quedó en, en el desierto, me dijo. Y yo, pues, ¿cómo que se quedó en el desierto? Le dije yo, pues, yo dije, en cuanto él me dijo, se quedó en el, en el desierto, tiene seis días que se quedó en el desierto, me dijo. Yo dije, mi hijo está muerto. Marco had been with a group in the desert, but got left behind when he couldn't keep up with them. Undeterred by this news, Carolina continued her search, checking missing persons' websites, contacting migrant shelters. Eventually, her determination led her to Robin Reinecke and her team in Tucson. They added Marco's details to their database. 
Initially, there was no match. But six months after he disappeared, Carolina received an email from Robin. There was a potential new lead. Ese día yo amanecí así. O sea, agarré, como dicen, valor. Y dije, voy a revisar. Y lo abrí. Y ahí estaba. Ahí estaba él. Si lloro, sobre. Al ver su pantalón. Y el lugar. Supe que era él. That email contained a photo of a pair of trousers found on a body that seemed to match information Carolina had supplied to Robin. Shortly before Marco crossed, his father had loaned him a pair of camouflage pants for okay. the journey. Mm -hmm. And his father is a little bit um, bigger. And so he removed a button and adjusted the pants so that they could uh, be a little bit tighter mm -hmm. for Marco. That was the really key identifying feature for the mother. It really, that, that was what convinced her. Yeah, Robin then insisted on the DNA test that proved that it was indeed Marco Antonio's body. Si no hubiera sido así, quizás todavía no lo tuviera aquí. O sea, es muy importante lo que ella hace. De hecho, yo ahí estoy dispuesta, como le dije a Robin, si algo puedo hacer por las mamás de otras, otros jóvenes, ahí estoy. Although Carolina and Robin have never actually met, families such as Carolina's are often extremely grateful for what Robin does. It breaks my heart how um, intensely they would be suffering so that when they're being informed of a death that they feel thankful. I can't imagine being thankful to the person that told me that my father died. Altar, a small dusty Mexican border town on the edge of the Sonoran Desert. It's thought to be where Marco Antonio set out from on his journey to the United States, as plenty of others do. The whole town revolves around the illegal border trade, and there are dozens of shops catering to migrants' needs. Crossing the desert into the north is no small undertaking, and any would-be migrant needs certain key survival things. Certainly a hat, protect you from the sun, of course, camouflage to also hide you from the US Border Patrol. Some uh, vital first aid and toiletries and then most extraordinarily, something I've never seen before, carpet slippers. You slip these over your shoes, and when you walk, you leave no footprints in the sand. Before setting off on their treacherous journey, many of the migrants come to the church in Altar to ask the Virgin of Guadalupe, the patron saint of Mexico, for her protection in the desert but some will need more than just prayers to make it to the United States. In a van, waiting alone to be taken to the border itself, I found 15-year-old Francisco from Guatemala. He showed me what he was taking. A blanket, of course, the carpet slippers to get through. And somehow this little collection of items is supposed to get him across the desert. It's tragic, it's actually heartbreaking. Sí, porque yo, sí, la verdad, mente, tengo 10, 15 años, porque este, mi padre estaba este, accidentado y él está en pedido ahorita, por eso yo tengo que luchar por mi vida, pues si no salgo, pues sigo lo mismo, está lo duro en la vida, sí, lo duro que está en nuestra vida en Guatemala. I've seen that part of Guatemala where he's from and it is extremely, extremely poor, it's very rural, it's a very, very tough life. Okay, bueno, suerte. Cuídate. Suerte en el desierto, cuídate mucho. Waiting in a hostel for her moment to cross is Michaela. She broke her leg on her last attempt to enter the US, but that won't deter her. She spent many years in the States, indeed her children were born there, and she's desperate to return. Ya mi, ya he intentado ocho veces. Ocho. Ocho. Eight times. Sí. 
tres veces cada que vengo. Vine hace como dos años e intenté tres veces y no pude pasar. Do you feel frightened about going through the desert and everything that's involved with that? No tengo miedo. No, yo ya he pasado hambre, frío, hasta los huesos y calor cuando uno va caminando en el junio. Uno lleva su agua y se pone como café. Y uno con esa sed va sudando así. Y uno agarra el agua, puro café, no consuela nada. Y así hemos caminado. Y, y cuando uno camina en la arena, lleva uno los zapatos y todavía... Y se siente que no lleva nada del caliente que se pone en la tierra. Siente que va en el, así, pelado el pie, sin nada. Y, y no me importa, voy a ir. For Carolina, that journey has only brought sadness to her family. She has written a song, especially for her son, Marco Antonio, called I'm Going to Ask God for Five More Minutes. Hasta el mismo nombre lo dice, ¿no? Pues cinco minutos para estar con él. Nada más. She has at least been able to give her son a decent burial, thanks to Robin Reinecke's efforts. But her advice to others thinking of making the same journey is blunt. Yo les diría que no. Definitivamente. Que no se vaya. I think it's a beautiful desert, but it's also a very tragic landscape. Robin Reinecke and her team have now helped return hundreds of migrants' bodies, like Marco Antonio's, to their families. But she is determined that their work also affects a wider change. The number one thing is thinking about the border more humanely, that human life needs to be a, a part of the discussion. I think there's a way um, that lives could be spared if people wanting to come and work didn't have to walk through the desert. No matter what one thinks of the rights and wrongs of entering the United States illegally, few would want to see so many deaths in the process. But the irresistible lure of a better life sits just across the border, and for many, the temptation will continue to be too great.